just start out talking a little bit about myself. I, uh, my name is Marcus Sorensen, and I've been with the CloudStack community since about 2011. Um, 2012, I started to commit code back. Um, I think 2012 was our first uh, CloudStack conference uh, here in Vegas. Um, so it's been a long time. I, I focus mostly on KVM and also the storage and network implementations on KVM. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about Cloud Init. Um, how many of you are familiar with Cloud Init? So most of you. Um, how many of you have actually used it to customize a virtual machine? Okay, so a couple of people. Um, so I'm, most of this discussion is not really cloud stack specific. It's uh, more around just how you use cloud in it in general, and it can be apl applicable to AWS or uh, you know any place. And I'll talk a little bit about the implementation uh, of cloud in it in cloud stack. Um, but most of this is, is pretty basic, like get your feet wet, uh, kind of show you the ins and outs. Uh, one of the things I've found is that um, the Cloud Init documentation can be a little bit sparse, especially when it comes to functionality and in individual modules. So my hope here today is that I can kind of give you a, a little bit of a head start and kind of give you a mental model of uh, how some of the pieces of Cloud Init work so you don't have to go through the trial and error uh, quite as much as, as I did. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't expect to take the full uh, the full time today, but uh, we'll just see how how far we get and how it goes. Um, so, what is Cloud Init? Uh, if you look it up uh, in the documentation, uh, they call it the de facto multi multi distribution package that handles early initialization of a cloud instance. Um, so, what that boils down to is it's a set of services that uh, are installed into your uh, VM. And uh, on, on boot up, those services come up and they look at some extra data that are, that's passed to your VM. And um, the individual services, they kick off and um, do certain configurations. Uh, so you can run modules and they can do things like uh, format your file system for you. Uh, they can add users. They can configure network details, uh, set up your SSH keys. Uh, you can do all sorts of things to kind of get the VM up and usable and uh, working how you would want to uh, have it work as an admin. So you kind of think of it as like, uh, you know, there are lots of uh, tools in this space. There are things like Puppet and Ansible and things that you can reach out to a VM or to any instance uh, or server and can configure those. Um, but this is kind of like the way to bootstrap uh, a VM that's been brought up from a template and customize it. Uh, one thing I'd mention is uh, it's primarily developed uh, by Canonical, um, and it's dual licensed under GPL3 and Apache 2. Uh, it also defines a spec for the configuration, so we'll go over that. Um, this is kind of a basic, uh, basic overview. So a user uh, of a cloud service wants to deploy a virtual machine. Uh, when they deploy the virtual machine, they provide this user data which is configuration that we'll go over in a minute. Um, they provide that, and the cloud interface, whatever they're, they're talking to, whether it be the AWS API or some user interface or the cloud stack API, um, that cloud interface is going to take the user data and it's going to push it into a data source. And there are multiple data source implementations, and uh, I'm going to cover some of those uh, today. But then this, uh, this cloud orchestration system Oh, it provisions the instance, and then inside the instance, you have these cloud init services installed. And it, they know how to reach out to that data source and pull that, uh, that user data uh, that the user provided. And then it takes that data, processes it, and does all the customization. Um, yeah. So that's kind of at a high level how the whole system works. <clears throat> um, so let's talk about these services that are installed inside the VM. Um, there are, I think there are four official services, um, and then there's generator, which is kind of a configuration option. Um, so the, yeah, so the generator uh, decides if the cloud admin services are going to run at all. Um, and then the individual services, like if you do a system CTL, uh, list units, 
you'll see all these different cloud uh, cloud init services. There's cloud init local, which comes up before networking and gives you the opportunity to configure networking uh, on the system. So it's like the earliest. It also is capable of reading the local data source. Um, what we mean by a local data source is basically things that don't require networking to reach out to a data source. So uh, if, if your data source provider is like config drive or an ISO or something that the VM can have access to without actually having networking, um, then uh, it, can, it can actually pull in that data source. Um, and the reason why that's important is because your user data itself uh, can provide things like network uh, setup information. And so, if, so that's going to require, you know, you have a chicken and an egg situation if uh, you have a network data source and you're trying to configure networking, um, you know. So uh, your local data source is what you'd use for doing network setup. Uh, then there's the, net, the cloud init service, uh, which um, is done after network is set up. Um, and that's controlled by, or that, that runs uh, the modules defined in the cloud init modules section. Um, then you have the config service that comes up after that, and that's usually where you're going to do things like uh, partition file system, or partition block devices and create file systems and things of that nature. Uh, and then you have the final service. Um, that's normally where you do package installations. Uh, things that you're going to lay on top of your finished system. Uh, you can set up SSH keys, for example, um, and then you can also do a phone home. Uh, so there's the capability to tell CloudInit to reach out to a URL, for example, and say, hey, I'm done, you know, I've configured my virtual machine. Um, so there's there's a lot to it, and um, it can be there can be a little bit of trial and error figuring out how all of these uh, services uh, work and when to put things in certain services. Um, so let's talk a little bit about data sources. Um, data sources are where, are, they're kind of the handoff point between uh, the VM and the orchestration system. Uh, they kind of reside in the middle. Um, the orchestration system will populate the uh, data provided by the user, and then the VM needs to know how to reach out to that. So CloudInit defines an API uh, for fetching that user data. Um, so it's up to the data source to implement that API. Uh, and CloudStack, uses, CloudStack provides uh, a special CloudStack data source, which is based on the virtual router. And so that data source module knows that it has to look up the virtual router um, address out of the DHCP uh, information on your system. And then it can go and reach out to that virtual router um, at a certain URL, and it can fetch that user data. Uh, the other one it supports is config drive v2, uh, which is actually based on the OpenStack model, and it's a, it's provided as an ISO uh, in, in into the VM, and so that would be an example of a local data source. So you could you could configure the VM's networking based on that. Um, one thing that's interesting about the way the data sources are set up is uh, if you want to create a new data source, uh, you can do that in multiple ways. You can uh, create a new module uh, that knows how to reach out to your data source. So if you've got some special web point, uh, web endpoint that you want the VM to reach out to to get its meta or user data, um, you can create a new module. The other, the other thing you can do is have your data source um, emulate or uh, implement someone else's model. So for example, the, the way the Amazon um, provides user data is it uses a link local IP address. So when the cloud init service uh, kicks on, it tries to reach out to 169.254, 169.254, and fetch uh, user data. And so I may not be Amazon, but if I could emulate that and make somehow make 169.254, 169.254 return metadata, then I can, you know, I can implement it the way that Amazon does it. So that's that's what Cl uh, CloudStack has done with Config Drive. Uh, OpenStack uh, published this Config Drive spec and said, "This is how our module expects to find the data," and we implemented that. So uh, modules are uh, they're basically bundles of Python code, usually um, that implement specific tasks. So 
you'll have a module, for example, that um, formats a file system. Uh, you have a module that sets up SSH, uh, a different module that creates users for you. Um, the modules have a frequency property, uh, namely it'll it'll be once, instance, or always. Um, and the difference, or the yeah, the difference between these is your uh, cloud and edge services. They're coming up uh, and running every single time you boot the system, um, but it knows that it's only going to run a certain module anytime like the VMU UID changes. So per per instance would be anytime the VMU UID changes, it's going to rerun your module. Um, once is like it only ever runs one time, and so you need to be aware of that if you're creating a template. Um, if you create a template and your module is already run then it's never gonna run again even when you clone that template. Uh, so those are, there's some tricky things around the frequencies uh, when you're developing and trying to build something that will do configuration for you. And always, of course, it's always going to call that module and process the, the data. Each module uh, has, has a defined configuration uh, in the cloud init user data. And I'll show you an example of this, but um, Basically, it allows you to pr provide customized inputs to each module. Uh, for example, um, the partitioning module, uh, you can provide uh, which device to look for. You can provide um, how you want the partitions. So you can say, I want 50% of it to be, um, yeah, I want three partitions. I want a 50% and a 50%, or 50%, 25, and 25, right? Something like that. Um, and each module has kind of a custom uh, set of YAML that it supports. And that's that's one, that's probably one of the harder things as far as uh, playing with CloudInit is uh, understanding the exact syntax and the config keys that a module supports, uh, looking for examples and things like that. Um, sometimes, it, sometimes you have to actually go look at the code of the module to kind of understand uh, what, what it supports if you can't find an example. Um, the bundled modules um, are found in the CloudNet source. So uh, if you do have trouble figuring out which keys uh, a specific module supports, you can go look at the source code. And if you look in the CloudNet um, source code in this directory, CloudNet slash config, you'll see all of the modules there. Uh, and you can look at the individual one. Um, <clears throat> So these modules, uh, when we look at the actual cloud configuration, um, you'll see there's a cloud init section, a cloud config section, and a cloud final uh, section. And those correspond to the actual services. And so what you can do is you can actually link individual modules to run uh, when each of those services kicks off. And so if you wanna, if you wanna run partitioning in the cloud final service, you can move the module to that section uh, or you know, rearrange them however you feel is appropriate. So let's talk about those configurations. Uh, there's a system level configuration called Etsy Cloud, cloud.cfg. Uh, and these are usually static. You would, usually what happens is when you build the template, you want to put a specific uh, cloud CFG there. And usually each distribution kind of has the same default uh, that's actually pretty wide, so it, it uh, provides nearly all of the modules that are available will be defined there. And I think by default, like it tries to use the AWS one first and then it, like it goes through all of the data sources looking for, um, for um, instance uh, user data. That can also be problematic. Uh, if you start, if you install the cloud and services, but you don't have any sort of user data, like if you spun up a VirtualBox VM and you install CloudInit, it might take five minutes for the VM to come up because as those services start up, they're going to start looking for uh, the user data and it's going to go through all the data sources and each one of those has a timeout. And so I think like just looking for the AWS data source, it's going to take two minutes before it times out. So you want to be kind of careful uh, when you're installing CloudInit that you um, make sure that the data sources that you care about are there uh, before you enable the services. Um, so Etsy Cloud, Cloud CFG, 
um, like I said, it's usually static. Um, you usually don't change that. You put it in the template and uh, you let it you let it be. Then uh, at a higher level of customization, you have the user data. And that's usually what's dynamic. So, did you have a question? Yeah, so that, uh, that path that C plug, that's inside the virtual machine. Right. Uh -huh. So you generate it inside the virtual machine. Yeah, when, so, so when you install CloudNet, that's actually provided in the package. Usually each distribution has its own kind of defaults. Um, and above that, there are actually defaults that are just like native inside Cloud Init, and then Etsy Cloud, Cloud CFG is like the first level of override. Um, so uh, yeah, one level above that for customization is the user data configuration. And so we call that the dynamic configuration because every VM that can come up can have different uh, inputs to that. And we can customize, you know, uh, at that level. And there are actually a variety of format options. Uh, I'll go over that in just a second. Um, then there's also instance metadata, and that's usually provided by the orchestration system. Um, so things like the VM UUID um, and things like that uh, can be provided uh, by the orchestration system, they can actually be used as variables in the cloud init data. Um, so that's since that depends on the orchestration system, you kind of have to play with that a little bit more. Uh, it's not there's not like a static set defined uh, list of VM metadata that you're going to have um, available to you. But just just be aware that you can use that instance metadata as variables uh, in cloud init. Um, so user data formats. So I'm launching a VM and I want to provide this custom user data, but what kind of data can I actually provide and, and what can it do? Um, so the most basic thing is if you just take a shell script and you pass a shell script as user data, uh, Cloud and it will run it. Uh, and so you can, you know, that's pretty powerful. You can do a lot of things just with a shell script um, on boot. Um, you can also provide include files which are actually files containing URLs to other user data files. So you can do all sorts of interesting things here, like um, you could have static snippets of user data to do various things, and you could post them out on a web server. And then you could actually provide just an include file and say, I want to use this piece of user data and this one and this one. You can kind of combine a bunch of pre-baked pieces of user data um, to your, your VM and kind of mix and match. So that's really flexi uh, flexible. You can also add an upstart job uh, placed in, so it's just an, uh, like a system uh, startup script. Uh, it'll be placed in Etsy and it. Uh, you can pass uh, boot hook data, uh, which is basically a, it's a special script that's put in the varlib cloud directory and executed. Um, you can put in what's called a part handler, which is Python, and it will. You can actually write some Python code that will override what a normal what a, the module would do, um, or you can write a new module and provide that dynamically uh, through the part handler. Um, most of what I'm going to go over, and a lot of what most people use, is what's called Cloud Config, which is a special uh, YAML format. Um, and that's what I was talking about. Um, with, with cloud config data, you can actually provide YAML to the individual modules, and you can override the uh, Etsy cloud, cloud CFG file as well. Or if you want to, you can create a my multi-part uh, archive. And with that, you can take any of these, and, or all of them, and put them into a single um, uh, user data and pass that. So there are all sorts of things you can do uh, provide mix and match. I'm going to focus mostly on the cloud config. Uh, I think other than that, uh, a lot of people use shell scripts um, and a lot of these other things I didn't even know existed until I started to put together this uh, presentation. <laughs> so uh, especially like the MIME multi-part, that's really cool. I think that you can, uh, you can do like a shell script and cloud config and pass them together, uh, for example. Uh, so in order to get started, you first have to install Cloud Init. Then you have to, you probably want to at least customize Etsy Cloud, Cloud CFG, or review what is there. Uh, then you want to 
uh, create a template from that, and then you want to uh, deploy that template with user data. Um, so that's the basic process. Uh, installation is pretty simple. Most distributions uh, will have Cloud Init packages available. Um, yeah, you can. So you can install it into a running one, or you can add it to Kickstart or something like that, uh, so it gets installed. But usually from a repo. So this is an example. I know it's a little bit small. This is an example of Etsy Cloud Cloud.cfg. And I like this. So this is the data source that I have for, that I have configured here. And I actually like this combination. And I'll blow it up here in a minute. Uh, this specific combination says first look for config drive then look for cloud stack, and then assume that we don't have any uh, user data. And so what that does is uh, probing for the config drive data source is really fast. It just looks to see, hey, do I have an ISO that's labeled with this with this, uh, uh, this specific for, uh, format? And I don't remember what it, or it just, just has a label that it looks for. Uh, that's really fast. And then it, it tries to resolve the cloud stack virtual router and call out to that to see if there's user, user data, and then it fails. So this is kind of like a, a fail-safe, like um, this would support any any data source that CloudStack supports. Um, let's go through these one by one. So we talked about the data source. Uh, now the network config, again, this is, so as we're booting up, this would be the cloud init local service kicks on, um, and it would, it would do our networking config. So you could actually pass like if if you uh, wanted like a certain DNS server or something like that, uh, you could pass customized network configuration here. Uh, disabled just means doesn't necessarily mean that networking is going to be disabled. It just means the cloud on it is going, not going to try to configure your networking. So if your VM template already has DHCP set up, uh, it's just going to use DHCP. Uh, then there's this section. So this corresponds with the actual Cloud Init uh, system CTL service. And you can see here, uh, so on, well, I don't know if you can see it because, you know, it's pretty small. But this section here says Cloud Init modules. And we're defining all of the individual mo modules that are going to run when the Cloud Init service starts up. And so you can see things like it's growing partition, resizing file system, sending the host name. Uh, setting up SSH, uh, adding users and groups. Those are, that's a sampling of what you would get. And then when the cloud config service kicks off, it's going to run these modules. And here I have things like uh, disk setup. Uh, I want to add new mounts. Um, I can run user scripts. Um, I want to reset my SSH authentication keys. Uh, things like that in the config. So if you write a new module, you can see here, you can put it in a specific stage uh, of CloudInit, so to speak, or you can take the existing ones and rearrange them uh, however you see fit. And they're actually going to run in the order that you see here. Um, one thing to keep in mind, let's see, Hello? let me finish covering this. So note on overrides, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, there's going to be a default. Uh, there are going to be defaults baked into Cloud Init natively, and then Etsy Cloud, Cloud CFG, is kind of like the distribution specific uh, overrides, and then um, and then uh, above that you have the actual user data that would override your Cloud.CFG, and the configs are merged. They're not, they're not totally replaced. So if you have things in Cloud CFG, but you didn't put them in your customized stuff, it's not going to just disappear. Like It lays it over the top. Uh, we talked about defining modules for a stage. So one thing that's interesting to note here is um, I have my Cloud Init modules stage, and I'm running these individual modules in the Cloud Init uh, service when it starts up. Here I've defined, though, it, it, if you recall, I said that each module has a frequency. If you look in the documentation, there's a default frequency, and it will say this only runs once, or it runs per instance, 
or it runs always. Uh, you can actually over, override that. So you can say, uh, like write files usually only runs, uh, I think, once. Uh, if you want it to do that every single time the system boots, you can change the frequency to always using this sy syntax, and then it will always uh, run. So you can override the module frequency. Uh, and I mentioned they're run in order. Um, some modules do actually depend on other modules. Um, and so you need to make sure to include them both in the right order, which is kind of interesting. But uh, So I talked a little bit about module frequency. So there's once, once per instance, uh, which uh, anytime the VM UUID changes, so anytime you take that template and you clone it, uh, it's going to run that again. Um, and then always runs every boot. And as I mentioned, modules have a default frequency. So here's some examples of some module-specific configuration. And this would go into your user data, for example, um, your cloud config user data. So let's say I want to actually run a certain command uh, when the VM comes up. Uh, so I would use the run CMD module. And then I, I can say, so here I have, I have ls minus l slash. Um, or I want to echo the date. Or any bash script or command that you would run on the command line, you can actually use the run CMD module and, and run that. So if you want to. If you wanted to manually format a file system, for example, instead of using the actual file system module, you could put it into a run CMD. Um, so that's that's kind of like a catch-all. Um, you can also just use a script, I think, um, or get some job done too. Here's another example with the grow part module. Um, you can set a mode, you can set which devices, and you can refer to it by actual the path where it's mounted, or you can refer to it by the device ID. Um, and so that module, I think, uh, allows you to just kind of consume whatever space is left. So if you imagine that you have a disk that's, re that's um, if you have a template that's, say, 10 gigs, and you resize the root partition to 20 gigs or something like that um, before you start it, then this would actually make the partition fill up the rest of the space. Um, you can also add yum repos, uh, for example. If you want to add extra VM repos uh, per VM, you can define them there. Um, so those are just some examples of like uh, module-specific configuration, and every module is going to have its own, you know, its own configuration. Oh, I can make comments about my own experience with the run command. I don't know if anyone else has used the run command module out in it, but I can tell you that when it runs through the whole system from user data through the module all the way to execution. In execution, what it does is generates a rather, in my opinion, naive shell script. It basically takes all those commands and goes, command, 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 you know, you know, like, not doing anything about, well, how did that, was that command successful? Was it exit code? Do I guarantee, you know, a, an overall exit code from the shell script? Is that propagated back through the service, etc., etc.? So you've got to be a little bit careful, depending on what your expectations are coming in, as to how the system actually behaves. Yeah, and that's that's a good point. Is that uh, while Cloud Init is is a framework, um, each of the modules are kind of independently maintained and are, are of varying quality and behavior. So um, you know, they they don't all adhere to the same um, you know the, the same standards, and that's kind of that kind of is shown here, where each one has its own configuration. Um, and if you don't like the behavior of, of one, you can do a different thing. So like, uh, maybe you don't like how run CMD works, but maybe you can provide that bash script in a multi-part, uh, like we talked about uh, earlier. Or you can do, uh, you can use the write files and you can write out a bash script to a certain location. And so if the file is there and, and you can run that separately. Uh, so there are all sorts of ways to, to get done what you need to get done to the VM. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Cloud on it. So this, uh, it could recently be rewritten to desired state configuration. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So it's yeah. You you it it doesn't necessarily um, retry. So there there are certain uh, configuration systems that you specify the de the desired state and it keeps trying to get to that state until it gets there. Um, 
cloud init is kind of like a one shot thing, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, the, the the module itself could could try to heal and fix itself. Yeah. All right. So cloud side data sources, um, they're configuring they're configured at the network offering level, and I think that's because historically um, it's been like a network provided service. Um, so. You can't really see it here, but if you were to go and add a network offering uh, under supported services, you could check user data, and then you could say where that's coming from. So there's virtual router and config drive, VPC virtual router, and then there's this bare metal user data provider, um, which I think is a part of the metal as a service uh, that Canonical um, has put together. I don't know a whole lot about that piece, but I can tell you that the... Uh, the virtual router and VPC virtual router are actually a, a web HTTP web endpoint that um, the virtual router hosts, and I think it uses um, I think it uses uh, what's that called? Um, it to it, it? Yeah. Uh, well, it uses it. Yeah, it, it uses Apache, but the the path um, I think it uses was like HT access files to. Um, to make sure that only certain VMs have access to certain user data and metadata. Um, and then, of course, we mentioned Config Drive uses an ISO. And I think that someone mentioned there's some limitations around that, like uh, you have to be using... So it'll store the ISO on secondary storage, and that's for compatibility with the VMware. Uh, you can also, there's a global config to say, put my Config Drive on primary storage. But I think that only works currently for file system-based uh, primary storage. So like block devices, it doesn't work with. Um, not to get off on a tangent, but I think it would be, at least for KVM, I think it would be nice to specify like a, like a scratch space directory that the agent can use or something like that. Uh, so you could, you could do, because the user data is usually very, very tiny, um, but it would be nice to be storage system agnostic and still be able to provide some of this uh, stuff. That's ultimately just tiny metadata. Um, so I've already covered most of this. Um, ultimately, the the data source just curled. Just well, it doesn't curl, but it it uh, makes an HTTP get to the uh, router IP latest slash user data um, to fetch its uh, its user data. Um, and I think this is this is available, like any recent cloud init will have the cloud stack data source built into it. Uh, I think two or three years ago, there was kind of a question as to whether or not it would work, but I think today, um, pretty much any distribution is going to have um, a recent uh, cloud stack data source driver. <clears throat> uh, config drive is config drive v2 format. Um, like I mentioned, you can actually set it to host on the secondary storage or on the primary storage. Um, and you can use the config drive to do network customization. So add like DNS servers and things like that if you need to. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, what I showed earlier. So this is the data source configuration that I would personally use in Cloud CFG uh, to work with CloudStack to be the most compatible. Uh, and then that gives you the freedom to use config drive or the virtual router um, as data sources, and it will just find which one works. Uh, so as far as providing user data, if we go all the way back to the beginning, we talked about how the user is interfacing with uh, some sort of uh, cloud service. And in this example, uh, I have the Cloud Stack API, uh, deploy virtual machine, user data equals, and then we give it base64 encoded user data. So if you have your YAML file, your cloud, or your bash script, or whatever it is, uh, you can use something like this. You can do cat user data, gzip it, base64 it, and then that uh, that string that's left is what you can pass in the user data. Uh, CloudStack has a 32 kilobyte limit on HTTP post. Um, I don't recall if that was a CloudStack cloud specific limit, or if that's a uh, Something more fundamental, I don't recall. 
Uh, you can also update. So update virtual machine would be uh, if I have an existing VM and I want to update its uh, cloud init data. So this would go back to those modules that will run always on every boot. Uh, for example, you can give new user data a new configuration, and then you can restart the service or you can restart the VM, and it will reconfigure the VM to whatever you changed. Um, it has to restart. Well, it has to, the, the service has to restart somehow. So you can restart the VM, or if you have some way to orchestrate the restart of the cloud and its services inside the VM, um, then it would pick it up. But basically, you need to tell it to go pick up and, and rerun through the process. So it's definitely, it's not a replacement for like a Puppet or Ansible or something that would uh, maintain the life cycle of the VM. It's really just that initial customization. I want to change, I want to, you know, change how my file system's laid out or, or add users or something like that, set up LDAP, you know, uh, whatever the initial bootstrapping is. Um, one of the things that, that people do with user data, for example, is they would set up the initial keys or the initial access that their Puppet or, you know, their other configuration system would use. And then once they have that, then they can, uh, they can maintain the system. Uh, here's, here's an example of cloud config data uh, that could actually be used to uh, partition uh, a, a data disk, uh, set up a file system on it, and then mount those. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying dev VVB, and you can, there are different ways that you can refer to the devices. Uh, I just chose in this example to use the actual uh, device path. Uh, I'm saying that I want a GPT partition, and I want 33, um, let's see, what was it? Oh yeah, so I want 33% of that disk to be uh, a Linux partition. So 82 is, is the uh, Linux device, uh, the Linux partition format. Um, so I think 83 is a swap device and things like that. Um, you don't have to specify the actual partition type, um, but I want 33% to be this partition type and then I want the remaining 67% to be a separate. So I've got two partitions here. Um, I set up the first one as swap, so 82 is swap. And then um, the second one, I'm going to set up as uh, EXT4. And then I'm going to mount my uh, first partition as swap. I'm going to mount my second one as slash data. So you can kind of see how that, how that works. And this is actually relying on three separate modules inside Cloud Event. So if I wanted to, I could do the disk setup in um, like the cloud init service, and then I could do the FS setup in the mounts and the cloud config service um, if I wanted to. So um, then what happens if, if something in the middle fails? Um, it just doesn't. It just falter. Just, yeah. So so you would you'd actually see errors in the logs in cloud init, but there's no like there's no user feedback like through cloud stack or through yeah. But you could you you could log on to the system. You could go look at your cloud net logs, and you could see see what the error is. Um, so there are a bunch of examples out there um, on the cloud net uh, website. So it's just cloudnet.readthedocs.io, um, and there are a whole whole host of examples and things you can do. Um, uh, some. Some things that have helped me uh, when I'm actually developing. So you can imagine like trying to develop the right cloud init data can be a little bit time consuming and you're kind of running through it over and over again and making sure that you have the, the right syntax or whatever. Um, so when I'm doing that, there are a couple things that are useful. There's actually a cloud init uh, utility on the command line. Um, the first thing to do is to remember that you clear your data often uh, because every time every time you actually run it, if the module frequency is once or per instance, there's actually a, a, a file that CloudNet uses to keep track of whether or not that module is run before. And so you'll end up in a situation where like you've changed your, your, your uh, user data but it's not doing anything. You're not seeing any changes, and that's because the module it knows that it's already run once. And so uh, you can do cloud init dash clear to clear that out. Uh, cloud init init will run the um, 
the cloud init service or cloud init stage and the local stage if you pass dash dash local. Um, cloud init modules will run the init, config, and final stages. Cloud init clear will clear the, the run data. Um, cloud init single, you can actually target a single module and say, I will only want to run the disk part or the SSH module against my data. Um, cloud init query, you can use to look up uh, the individual metadata uh, for the instance, and then you can uh, see which metadata is available in your environment. Um, cloud init analyze show is really good for sh showing you uh, which modules actually ran and how long each module took. So it's good for troubleshooting. Um, you can see that there's, so I know you can't read this from there, so it says starting stage and then local, and then finish stage, it gives you timing, and then it did the init network, and then modules can big. And so it gives you timing the data and whether or not each one succeeded, uh, which is really handy for troubleshooting. The question here is that I would get those logs from the VM itself. So, so as yeah, as as you're developing your Cloud Init YAML, um, yeah, you can you can see this data by running it against the user data that you have. Um, you can also see you can see some data in your um, there's a var log Cloud Cloud Init log uh, that has like everything that it ran through. But it's not quite as detailed as this, so it doesn't give you like the metrics and stuff. If you want to see like what's taking so long, or why didn't this work, or um, you can see it says found. Oh, you can't see <laughs> found network data from data source cloud stack, for example. So I want to audit and see which data sources is actually picking up and how long it takes to find the data sources. Uh, you can do that with this uh, cloud init analyze show. Uh, semaphores as I. Uh, talked about earlier, semaphores are the way that Cloud Init uh, determines if a module is already run and when it last ran. Um, so in varlib cloud instance uh, sem and varlib cloud sem, you'll see a file that's named the stage underscore module name dot frequency. And so if you find that for whatever reason you're not able to trigger a module you can go into the semaphores and you can, you can see if that semaphore is there because it may be locking you out of actually executing uh, the module. All right, so that's really all I have. And it looks like I'm just about out of time. So uh, well do, do you have any questions? I know it's kind of a slog just trying to like describe all this detailed stuff. But. Uh, Marcus, I think in one of your slides here, uh, instead of using either of secondary storage or primary storage to host, uh, you know, locally on the cable host itself, do you think that could be uh, a good solution? Because I think we can do that quite easily and it can then, I mean, if we do that way, then we don't have dependency on either of the primary or secondary storage or, or even care whether one is file system based or from the base. Yeah, I think, I think in general, I can't speak for obviously for all the hypervisors, but I think there are a whole bunch of things that could be solved by uh, providing the cloud stack agent a scratch space to do things like this. Is there, I think I can't think of anything on top of my head right now, but I think there are other instances as well where I was thinking, well, if there were just some scratch space where it could temporarily or, or you know host some small bit of data, um, then that would be that'd be really helpful. Why is that just so. a system temporary directory? Like yeah, yeah, just some some temporary space that we don't we don't really need to because if you think about it with primary storage, you really want to create like a whole block device to host uh, 10k or <coughs> worth of data or or something like that, you know. So in order to kind of overcome uh, the issues around um, not necessarily wanting to mount NFS everywhere for secondary storage just to host metadata, not necessarily wanting to um, have to create block devices on primary storage just to host metadata. Sure. It, it makes sense, I think, to have some scratch space. I have a question there. So, just thinking natively in Cloud Stack, is there a, an integration point for the phone home in Cloud Init? Is there something that could be relevant to Cloud Stack in phone home? Yeah, I mean, possibly. Um, 
you know, there's I, I, there aren't really any interfaces for CloudStack to tell you uh, whether or not the user data succeeded for a VM, but I could conceive of something similar to that. Um, you know, where I didn't want to know that my cloud, my VM through the API that my VM was really running until I knew the cloud in it had completed. Yeah, is that something that could be easily integrated? Um, it would take yeah something to think about for sure. It would, it would take some design work to kind of understand uh, how it actually does the phone home. If it's a web URL to the management server, whether it's talking back to the router VM, uh, whether you know, or, or some other means, but. Definitely, that, that would be an interesting thing. All right. Thanks, guys.